Welcome to A-Minder, a podcast where we summarize the latest publications on neurodegenerative disease research so that you can stay up to date with the newest findings. Every month, our team of scientists will sort and organize the titles into themes and present shortened versions of the abstracts. We'll make sure to mention the title, the journal, the first author, and the last author for each publication. Whether you're in the lab, on the bus, or cooking your meal, we hope you find this podcast helpful. Hi everyone, welcome back. How are you doing today? I know, I keep asking. (laughs) Find us on social media or shoot us an email. We love hearing from you. It's Sarah here today, recording from Vancouver, British Columbia, in the wee hours of the night. Today, I'll be hosting this episode on biomarkers and indicators of disease progression and Alzheimer's disease. You may already know that determining which patients are at a greater risk for developing AD is of great importance for effective interventions. The papers I'm presenting today were published in June 2020 and did not fit in our criteria for fluid biomarkers or A-beta detection in the brain or structural changes detected by imaging. Those are in separate episodes. Since there is not a tying characteristic for the 19 papers I'm presenting today, uh, here's a sneak peek. Iron as a biomarker, proteins such as TDP43, C-reactive protein, and enzymes, metabolism, oxygen levels. Do I have your attention? Yeah, I know. That was the most exciting thing ever, right? (laughs) I swear, I'll try my best to make this engaging and as informative as possible. Leave it up to us to summarize the abstracts and you go focus on doing awesome research. Speaking of summaries, I have Dr. Melissa Contimadza for summarizing all the abstracts I'm presenting today. Thanks, Melissa. Let's get down to business. We have five abstracts looking at different proteins, starting with a paper titled Utility of FGG PET in Diagnosis of Alzheimer-Related TDP43 Proteinopathy. It was published in a journal called Neurology by Butchuk, and the last author is Josephs. The current study evaluated FGG PET as an anti-mortem diagnostic tool for AD-related TDP43. If this is new to you, FDG refers to fluorodeoxyglucose, <laughs> and it is the tracer used in this procedure. The authors used a cross-sectional neuroimaging histologic analysis of patients with ant-mortem FTG PET and post-mortem brain tissue from the Mayo Clinic Alzheimer's Disease Research Center and Study of Aging with Alzheimer's Spectrum Pathology. Patients were assigned TDP43 positive status when inclusions were found in the amygdala. TDP43 positive cases showed significant hypometabolism across medial temporal, frontal superior medial, and frontal supraorbital regions. Only the frontal supraorbital region and ratio of inferior temporal to medial temporal metabolism was associated with TDP43 positive status. Taking the ratio across these regions increased case discrimination significantly. Overall, These findings show that TDP43 status is associated with regional hypometabolism and measuring these regions may predict this proteinopathy. Whoa, that was a mouthful. I spent a lot of time looking at TDP43 aggregates or inclusions in the context of ALS, uh, but I did not realize these aggregates garnered interest in AD research as well. I really like crossovers like this and often wonder how much they can tell us in terms of disease etiology. What do you think? Okay, the next paper is titled Relationship Between Urinary Alzheimer-Associated Neuronal Thread Protein and Epilipoprotein Epsilon for Allele in the Cognitively Normal Population. It was published in a journal called Neuroplasticity by the first author Li and last author is Han, and this is the second paper we're covering today. The current study looked into the levels of urinary Alzheimer-Associated Neuronal Thread Protein or AD7C-NTP. I know, that one's a mouthful too. Let's call it NTP, just for simplicity. Okay, so the authors were interested in uh, NTP uh, as a potential biomarker for APOE epsilon-4 alleles and a cognitive deficit in a cognitively normal population. They found no difference in urinary NTP levels between the normal control and subjective cognitive decline groups. However, 
These levels were significantly higher in APOE carrier status, and significant differences were also found between subjects with and without a history of coronary heart disease or diabetes. Overall, urinary NTP levels were associated with APOE status in cognitively intact individuals. These results suggest the potential for this target as a non-invasive biomarker for risk of cognitive decline. The next paper should have been presented in our episode on A-beta detection in the brain uh, as a diagnostic and predictive tool, but somehow it made its way here and it's too late for me to move it over. Ah. Sneaky, sneaky. I blame it on A-beta, since we always blame everything on A-beta in Alzheimer's. Mind you, I was the one who sorted the papers. Joke's on me. But hey, this gives me the opportunity to point to you that there are other episodes on this, if you're interested. Okay, I will stop blabbering now. The title of the third paper today is Topographical Distribution of A-beta Predicts Progression to Dementia in A-beta Positive Mild Cognitive Impairment. It was published by Bascoa, first author, and last author is Rosanetto, and you'll find it in a journal called Alzheimer's Disease Diagnosis, Assessment, and Disease Monitoring. Brain amyloid beta levels are usually measured as total concentration from cerebrospinal fluid and positron emission tomography, or PET. The study wanted to assess whether more specific information about the topographical distribution of A beta would give further insight into dementia progression. The authors used their radiopharmaceutical compound, 18F, or florbeptapir, in subjects diagnosed with amnesic, mild cognitive impairment, and positive for amyloid beta. They measured the standardized uptake value ratio across the brain. And they found that global or regional uptake ratios could not predict dementia progression. However, the spread of amyloid beta pathology across regions of the default mode network was significantly associated with dementia development. These results suggest that the regional distribution of amyloid beta may provide additional information regarding the risk of dementia progression. This may be a good time for me to remind you of our timestamp bibliography. We're very proud of it. If the paper catches your interest, Mark the time and check our list for each episode to find the original paper. You will find the details on how to access it in our episode's notes down below. Now, on to a different protein as a biomarker with a paper called C-reactive protein as a predictor of mild cognitive impairment conversion into Alzheimer's disease dementia. Published by Fernandez, first author, and last author is Santana. And you'll find this fourth paper in a journal called Experimental Gerontology. This is interesting. We just talked about CRP in my class this week as a blood biomarker for generally inflammation and organ failure. And now, C-reactive protein, or CRP for simplicity, has been found in AD pathological markers as well, including senile plaques and neurofibrillary tangles. This suggests that it may be associated with AD neuropathology. However, reports are conflicting over CRP levels and AD severity. Therefore, the current study determined the predictive value of CRP for mild cognitive impairment patients progressing to AD. The authors used a Cox regression model on demographical, neuropsychological, genetic, and laboratory variables. For the 42% of MCI patients that had progressed to dementia, the following were independent predictors of the progression. Okay, get ready. Lower cerebrospinal fluid, amyloid beta 42, cognitive performance, and CRP levels. In conclusion, CRP may serve as a potential predictor and offer additional information regarding the MCI conversion to AD. Now, the last paper in the general protein category looks at an enzyme. This is paper number five today. Its title is PET Imaging of Soluble Epoxide Hydrolase in Non-Humid Primate Brain with 18F FNDP. The first author of this paper is Du, or Du, and last author is Horty. And you'll find it published in European Journal of Nuclear Medicine and Molecular Imaging Research. Before we start, know that soluble epoxide hydrolase regulates level of epoxy eicosatrienoic Oh my goodness, <laughs> this is a long one. Okay, let's see how we can split it. Levels of epoxy eicosatrienoic. Did I get that right? 
epoxy acosatrionic. Okay, that. <laughs> so the soluble epoxide hydrolase regulates level of that word, the acids of epoxy, blah, 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 is an important player in neurovascular coupling. I apologize for that. Some of these words are really, really tricky to say. And I don't know about you, I'm more used to reading these things than saying them out loud. Anyways, so epoxide hydrolase is altered in a number of diseases, including AD, PD, stroke, depression, and vascular cognitive impairment. The current study tested 18F FNDP as a PET radio tracer for imaging soluble epoxide hydrolase. If you wanted more detail, uh, they did this through quantitative PET imaging and blocking doses with their selective inhibitor AR-9281 in the baboon brain and outbred mice. The radio tracer had high and rapid uptake in the baboon brain, which was blocked by the inhibitor in a dose-dependent manner. The authors determined an effective dose estimate for humans based on the biodistribution of the radio tracer in mice. The radio tracer also formed radio metabolites in mouse and baboon plasma, but less than 2% enter the brain. In conclusion, the proposed radio tracer is selective for soluble epoxide hydrolase and has potential for use in human subjects. The next series of papers also look at proteins, but I thought they fit well together under their own subcategory because they relate to the cholinergic system. I don't know why I assume cholinesterases were only relevant to disease mechanisms and treatment development, but here we are in the diagnostic tools category, and it does actually make sense that they would be considered for detection or predictive value. The first of the three papers in this category looked at cholinesterases specifically, and this one's titled Novel Turn-On-Off Paper Sensor Based on Non-Ionic Conjugated Polythiophene Coded CDTE quantum dots for efficient visual detection of cholinesterase activity. This is paper number six today, and it was published by first author Wu and last author Li in the journal called Analyst. Changes in acetylcholinesterase concentrations have been shown to be an indicator for AD. Having an intelligent analytical platform by which to detect these changes will allow for early and sensitive diagnosis. Here, the authors wanted to improve a novel conjugated polythiopene, or CP, uh, compound selectivity and sensitivity for acetylcholinesterase concentrations. They used cadmium telluride, so this is what they mean by CDT. So they used cadmium telluride quantum dots. Uh, I've never heard of quantum dots before, so I did a quick search. Hold on. Yeah, here's what I learned. In a paper published in 2015, Kim and colleagues describe quantum dots as zero-dimensional colloidal crystals that help to identify the chemical moieties, clinical diagnostics, and are also used for bioimaging and biosensing. Okay, now back to June 2020 with authors Wu and Li in this paper. Using cadmium telluride quantum dots, they were able to detect concentrations of acetylcholinesterases about eight times lower compared to pristine quantum dots. They developed an efficient, inexpensive, and disposable paper-based platform to visually detect acetylcholinesterase activity. More specifically, they focused on the color variation caused by the cadmium telluride and conjugated polythiopene combination. This method was shown to be accurate from recovery tests using human serum. These results support the use of this method for its simplicity, affordability, and sensitivity for acetylcholinesterase levels in real biological samples. I'm guessing if you're really big into chemistry, this was a fun paper to listen to, eh? <laughs> the next paper looks at acetylcholine receptors rather than cholinesterases. You'll find it published in a journal called EJNMMI, okay? EJNMMI Research. That's the name of the journal. <laughs> First author is Payne, and last author is Roe. And the title of the seventh paper is Human Biodistribution and Internal Dosimetry of 4-18F Fluorobenzyl Dexetamide dot two dots dot dot <laughs> a pet radiopharmaceutical for imaging muscarinic acetylcholine receptors in the brain and heart. I should practice reading these like a robot. Would that be more fun to you to listen to? 
maybe, maybe not, I don't know. Okay, so getting to the summary, FDAX, not to be confused with FedEx, so F-DAX is the first non-subtype selective fluorine 18 labeled tracer for muscarinic receptors. It has high regional brain uptake and is used in humans, which apparently are distinctive features of this tracer. Since muscarinic receptors are of great interest across various diseases, including AD, PD, schizophrenia, and depression, the current study characterized the F-DAX tracer based on biodistribution, kinetics, and radiation dose. By the way, when I say PD, I mean Parkinson's, in case that wasn't clear. Sorry. And AD is Alzheimer's. There was significant uptake in the brain and left ventricular myocardium with greater retention in the brain. The mean effective dose was similar to other 18F labeled tracers. The liver, heart wall, and lungs absorbed the largest doses. However, the absorbed dose was long enough to ensure the absence of toxicity effects. These assessments support the use of F-DAX as an imaging tool for muscarinic receptors in the brain. Now, still along the lines of acetylcholine receptors is a paper presenting a method. It was published in a journal called Molecules by first author Zlatopolsky and last author is Neumeyer. And this eighth paper is called Preparation of a First 18F Labeled Agonist of M1 Muscarinic Acetylcholine Receptors. M1 muscarinic acetylcholine receptors are commonly found at the postsynaptic nerve terminal in the forebrain region. These receptors have been associated with cognitive impairment in AD and other CNS diseases. Muscarinic receptors have been the target for the development of subtype selective PET tracers. However, the protocols for the preparation of 18F labeled ligands have not yet been published. This paper describes such a procedure for the preparation of an 18F labeled M1 agonist and its corresponding pinnacle boronate radiolabeling precursor and the non radioactive reference compound. Okay, ooh, <laughs> the authors used a convergent reaction protocol to prepare the target compounds. For further details about the preparations, please refer to the paper. This is really over my head, I apologize. But here's what I will tell you. The developed procedure granted their radio tracer a high radiochemical yield and purity. Altogether, a straightforward protocol for an 18F labeled M1 agonist as a selective PET tracer remains to be tested for experimental and diagnostic purposes. All right, this is a good time for a short break and to take a sip of water. <laughs> I know I need it. <laughs> Enjoy Anusha's beautiful music. I'll be right back. All right, on to three papers that looked at metabolism. This one was published in the American Journal of Geriatric Psychiatry and uh, by first author Krell Vouch and last author is Jeda. And this is the ninth paper of today's episode titled Brain Regional Glucose Metabolism, Neuropsychiatric Symptoms and the Risk of Incident Mild Cognitive Impairment, the Mayo Clinic Study of Aging. I'm seriously considering doing the robot voice. Okay, by now, it's becoming clear that we need measures for the early detection of AD. The authors of this paper joined the quest and looked at neuropsychiatric symptoms and brain regional glucose metabolism dysfunction as predictors. So again, they looked at neuropsychiatric symptoms and brain regional glucose metabolic dysfunction. They included mild cognitive impairment and cognitively unimpaired individuals. Here again, we encounter fluorodeoxyglucose positron emission tomography. Participants with depression or anxiety and reduced regional glucose metabolism had an increased risk of incident MCI compared to the reference group, MCI being mild cognitive impairment. Know that the reference group had normal regional glucose metabolism and no depression. Overall, the combination of neuropsychiatric symptoms and lower regional glucose metabolism is associated with greater risk of incident mild cognitive impairment diagnosis. That's it for this paper. Next paper in the metabolism category is paper number 10 and is titled Selection of the Optimal Intensity Normalization Region for FDG-PET Studies in Normal Aging and Alzheimer's Disease. 
Lots of pet studies today, huh? First author is Nugent, and last author is Duchenne, or maybe it's Nugent and Duchenne, my apologies. And you'll find it published in Scientific Reports. Pet imaging with the tracer 18F fluorodeoxyglucose. Ah, that word again. So FDG. So pet imaging with 18F FDG is mainly used to quantify brain metabolism in humans. Okay, yeah, we knew that. However, it's difficult to compare results across studies since different regions are used as a reference when calculating standardized uptake value ratios. Okay, yep, makes sense. That would be tricky. Therefore, the authors wanted to determine the optimal reference region that could be used to help normalize across studies in the context of healthy aging. Please refer to the paper for details regarding specifics of imaging analyses and calculations. They compared the sensitivity of using either the whole brain or the pons as a reference region. This was in relation to studying the posterior cingulate and precuneus NAD patients for hypometabolism. With the whole brain as a reference region, significant differences could only be detected in the precuneus. However, significant differences were detected in both the posterior cingulate and precuneus with the pons as a reference region. Overall, the study proposes that the pons as a reference region is more sensitive to hypometabolism in AD. It also highlights the caution when interpreting FDG PET data when different reference regions are being used. The last paper in the metabolism cluster looks at both lipid and protein metabolism and is called Hippocampus Proteomics and Brain Lipidomics reveal network dysfunction and lipid molecular abnormalities in APPPS1 mouse model of Alzheimer's disease. This is paper number 11, published by first author Zhang and last author Tan in the Journal of Proteome Research. The current study tried to uncover related targets that could be used as potential biomarkers for early diagnosis and therapy. To do so, the authors used proteomics and lipidomics screening in the brains of early-stage AD mice. They found significant differences in expression of protein and lipid targets related to biological pathways, such as, get ready, neuroactive ligand receptor, complement and coagulation cascades, PI3K AKT signaling and metabolic pathways, and glycerophospholipid metabolism. Okay, that's the end of the list. <laughs> Overall, this work further supports protein and lipid metabolism dysfunction in AD and provides novel biomarkers and potential therapeutic targets for early stage AD. Now moving away from protein and lipids into metals. We have two papers looking at iron with one titled Cross-Sectional and Longitudinal Assessment of Brain Iron Level in Alzheimer's Disease using 3T MRI. This is paper number 12. The first author is Damolina. The last author is Langkammer. And you'll find it published in a journal called Radiology. It has been shown that deep gray matter structures have higher iron concentration in AD patients. I didn't know that. However, it remains unclear whether the same is true for neocortical areas, which are difficult to measure using MRI. The purpose of the current study was to determine iron levels across brain regions using MRI at 3T with R2 star relaxation rate mapping. I'm sure this means something to you if you do MRI on a regular basis. <laughs> they did this in age-matched AD patients and healthy controls. They included the following anatomic structures. You ready? Okay, they looked at the neocortex and cortical lobes, basal ganglia, hippocampi, and thalami. Multivariable linear regression analysis was applied to differentiate the R2 star levels between groups and determine the association between long-term changes in R2 star values and cognition in the AD group. Median R2 star levels were higher in AD patients compared to controls in the following structures. The basal ganglia, total neocortex, occipital lobe, and temporal lobe. Only longitudinal changes on iron level from the temporal lobe were associated with cognitive function in the AD group. Overall, these findings show that iron concentration from deep gray matter and neocortical regions were higher in AD patients. Also, 
that the change in AD patient's temporal lobe iron level was linked with cognitive decline. If you have any idea on how to make these summaries um, related to imaging simpler, please let us know because we'd really like to make this more engaging, but we want to keep all the important information, which is difficult sometimes. The next paper, paper number 13, is titled Decreased Salivary Lactoferrin Levels Are Specific to Alzheimer's Disease, published by first author Gonzalez Sanchez and last author Scaro, and you'll find it in a journal called eBiomedicine. This is another paper zooming in on iron, but now you'll hear about lactoferrin, which is involved in iron absorption. Reduced salivary lactoferrin levels in AD patients suggest that the innate immune system is impaired. What? Salivary lactoferrin? This is something I haven't seen before. Okay. The authors assessed whether salivary lactoferrin was associated with cerebral amyloid beta load using amyloid positron image... Oh, PET. Amyloid PET. <laughs> So they use PET imaging to look at amyloid beta and see if it's associated with lactoferrin, right? Yeah, that's it. Uh, salivary lactoferrin was able to differentiate between AD, frontotemporal dementia, and control groups with significant sensitivity and specificity. Salivary lactoferrin has the potential to be useful diagnostic tool as a non-invasive and cost-effective strategy. Oh dear, yeah, they are right. This is definitely non-invasive compared to some other avenues suggested in this episode, like salivary lactoferrin. That'd be easy to get, right? Okay, now we have two papers looking at oxygen and the cerebrovasculature for the detection of early signs of AD. Paper number 14 is titled, Brain Oxygen Extraction is Differentially Altered by Alzheimer's and Vascular Diseases. The first author is Jiang, last author is Lu, you'll find it published in Journal of Magnetic Resonance Imaging. AD and vascular cognitive impairment, or VCI, are the most common types of cognitive dysfunction. While these diseases have different therapeutic plans, there's significant overlap between clinical symptoms and biomarkers between them. If you're interested in the link between the brain and the vasculature, may I interest you in episode 17? Ellen covers papers published in June that specifically address cerebrovascular changes in AD. Okay, now if you're still with me in this episode, let's continue. The current paper tested the extent that cerebral oxygen extraction fraction, or OEF, could be used to differentiate between AD and VCI. And remember, VCI is vascular cognitive impairment. Vascular risk factors, cognitive assessments, and CSF levels of A, beta, and tau were all measured. Now, oxygen extraction fraction was lower in those with greater cognitive impairment, but was higher with increasing vascular risk factors. Those participants with low vascular risks showed that lower oxygen extraction fraction was related to reduced cognitive performance and elevated amyloid burden. For participants with impaired cognition, higher oxygen extraction fraction was positively correlated with vascular risk factors. These findings suggest that OEF, or oxygen extraction fraction, is uniquely altered in AD and vascular cognitive impairment and may potentially serve as a biomarker for both diseases. Are you still with me? Good. I mean, I have no idea. I can't check this, right? <laughs> but don't worry. We're almost done. Next is a paper titled regional hyperfusion and cognitively normal APOE epsilon-4 allele carriers in midlife analysis of ASL pilot data from the prevent dementia cohort. That was me easing you into the robot mode. <laughs> so this is paper number 15. It was published in Journal of Neurology, Neurosurgery, and Psychiatry. The first author, McKiernan, last author, O'Brien. Regional cerebral hypoperfusion is a known characteristic of AD. However, changes in perfusion in cognitively healthy individuals that are high risk for AD development are less understood. Shedding light on this could lead to novel disease markers and therapeutic targets. Well, that's what this episode's about, right? The authors compared 3D arterial spin labeling MRI scans and cognitive performance in cognitively normal participants from the PREVENT dementia cohort. These participants are at a greater risk for AD development based on APOE epsilon-4 carrier status and family history. The APOE epsilon-4 carrier group showed 
regional hyperperfusion in the left cingulate, lateral, frontal, and parietal regions. The family history group showed hyperperfusion in the left temporal and parietal areas. Gee, I feel like you need an atlas to follow. <laughs> None of the perfusion measurements correlated with cognitive performance. Overall, these results suggest that regional cerebral hyperperfusion may be an early marker for those with increased risk for AD. This may reflect a functional compensatory mechanism and may be accelerating disease progression. Okay, now it's getting harder and harder to identify clusters. We have one on uh, excitability and neuronal responsiveness in identifying a predictive tool for AD. It's in a paper number 16 entitled Hyper Excitability in Aging is Lost in Alzheimer's. What is all the excitement about? Huh, I like this title. First off is Lockwood, last author's Duffy, and you'll find this paper published in Cerebral Cortex. First, increased excitability in neurons may be a sign for the development of late-onset, early-stage Alzheimer's disease, or LEAD, not to be confused with longitudinal early-onset AD, which also comes down to LEAD lead. Anyways, posterior cortical hyperexcitability is usually associated with aging, the authors hypothesize that this phenomenon happens before the deficit of neuronal activity. This deficit usually comes along with the impairment associated with LEAD, or late onset early stage Alzheimer's disease, as a reminder. They compare the behavioral and neurophysiological performances of normal adults with LEAD patients. During uh, what they use, yeah, a visual spatial attentional control task. Normal adults had preserved attentional control and showed frontal cortical signal incoherence and posterior cortical hyperresponsiveness. LEADs failed the attentional control task and there was no posterior hyperresponsiveness. These data suggest that one, age related signal incoherence, and two, an elevated cortical response may result in functional impairment associated with late onset, early stage Alzheimer's disease. Our next paper here, number 17, uses auditory processing to identify a biomarker for the detection of AD. Ah, this is new. Its title is 5X FAD mice show early onset gap encoding deficits in the auditory cortex. Auditory cortex. <laughs> First author is Weibull, and last author is Weir, and you'll find it published in Neurobiology of Aging. Now, recently, measures of central auditory processing, such as gap detection, have been suggested as potential biomarkers in both human patients and the 5XFAD mouse model. The current paper tried to explore gap detection deficits as a biomarker and the brain structures involved using the mouse model that I mentioned, 5XFAD. Gap detection deficits were found in two-month-old mice, so that was before AD-related pathology could develop. 5XFAD mice showed degraded gap responses and baseline firing rates in neurons from the auditory cortex in response to white noise. The aforementioned deficits were present at an earlier stage in males than females. Interesting. Hmm, okay. So these results suggest that early onset impairments to the central auditory system may be due to damage in the auditory cortex and connecting structures. Now, occasionally, we will come across a paper where a new model or new method is developed. We used to have a full episode dedicated to that, but we realized those methods were kind of all over the place. So we decided to spread them across episodes depending on the fit. The next two papers, or such papers, <laughs> will focus on a new method developed for... Okay, wait, the title will tell you. So paper 18 is titled AD-NET, Age-Adjust Neural Network for Improved MCI to AD Conversion Prediction. It was published by first author Gao, last author Su or Su, in the journal called Neuroimage Clinical. Deep learning research is an emerging field with a challenge of limited availability of medical imaging data. The authors wanted to address this challenge by extending deep models to neuroimaging research using transfer learning. Usually, transfer learning models focus on transferring the features from the pre-training to the fine-tuning stage. The authors developed an AD-NET or age-adjust neural network with pre-training model. 
They wanted to extract and transfer features as well as obtain and transfer knowledge in the form of an age-related surrogate biomarker. Compared to eight other classification models, ADNet was better able to predict MCI patients at greater risk for developing AD. Overall, the authors propose a novel strategy for deep learning research that may have great potential for at-risk MCI patients. Cool. Now in the following paper, oh, there's the last one. It's not so much a methods paper as it's about a resource. Its title is National Dementia Biobank, a strategy for the diagnosis and study of neurodegenerative diseases in Mexico. First author is Reyes Pablo, last author is Luna Munoz, and you'll find it published in the Journal of Alzheimer's Disease. We know how valuable donations of fluids and brain and other organs of deceased donors are so that we can better understand a neurodegenerative disease mechanisms and develop treatment. Therefore, the authors developed the National Dementia Biobank in Mexico as a resource for diagnosis, research, and tissue transfer. The biobank is associated with the Universidad Nacional Autónoma de México. The laboratory focuses on research regarding the molecular processing of the proteins in tauropathies and non-invasive early detection biomarkers for AD diagnosis. You did it! I hope you're still with me. <laughs> it was a pleasure to be your host today. Stay safe. Until next time. That's it for this episode. A huge thank you to the team that is working on sorting, summarizing, and scripting these abstracts, as well as the operations behind Aminder. The music is from Journey of a New Transmitter by Nusha Kamesh musician and fellow scientist, and now a member of the Aminder team. You can find the original piece and her other music on SoundCloud under Anusha Kamesh or on her YouTube channel, AK Music. Interested in joining the team? Give us a shout! We can always use help with content development, podcast editing, advertising, and you can be part of a new and exciting venture. Reach us by email at aminderpodcast at gmail.com or follow us on Twitter Oh, we're also on Facebook now. Don't forget to subscribe to our mailing list if you want access to the bibliography for each of our episodes. The references come with timestamps. Hmm, timestamps. So you can more easily locate the paper that caught your interest. Check our notes below for details on how to sign up. And very close to this, you'll also find a link to our feedback survey. Because, yeah, your feedback matters to us. So please, pretty please, let us know how we can make this podcast a better tool for you. And last but not least, thank you for tuning in with us. And on this note, we hope you found our podcast useful and accessible. Until next time.